Indeed, you be here today. Look forward to our times of worship. A little oasis in the middle of the week for us. Here of Christ, worship together. Let's take our chorus books and we'll sing number eight. Begin our time of worship. Oh, how merciful. Oh, how merciful. When I was lost in sin and shame, how the let me take the blame. Blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. When I could look down deep within and see the sinfulness of sin, Blessed Lord, how merciful Thou wast to me. Oh, how merciful, how merciful. Blessed Lord, how merciful Thou wast to me. Oh, how merciful, how merciful, blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. A sinner lost and so hell bent, yet thou saidst I must repent, blessed Lord. Merciful thou wast to me. I wonder why I should rebel with a soul deserving hell. Blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. Oh, how merciful. Blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. Oh, how merciful, how merciful. Blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. I'm not ashamed of all thy grace When thou came and took my place Blessed Lord, how merciful thou art to me And when this world ceases to be Eternal blood to speak for me Blessed Lord, how merciful Thou art to me. Oh, how merciful, how merciful. Blessed Lord, how merciful Thou art to me. Oh, how merciful. How merciful, blessed Lord, how merciful thou art to me. Amen. So let's take our Bibles and look together in Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29, my text is from verse 1 down to verse 14. I want to speak with you about what it is to have a righteous representative as opposed to an unrighteous representative. I think we understand that something about representation, especially when we see where God put Adam in the garden as the representative of his race. And when he fell, the consequences of his disobedience passed on every one of his race. So if you are alive right now and 
hearing me, that means you're a posterity, you're of the seed of Adam. We wouldn't be in this world were we not a seed of Adam. And when you consider what it is to be a sinner, the scriptures tell us that by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so sin passed upon all men. That's what it is to be under an unrighteous representative. But thank God the story doesn't end there. Because even as by one man sin entered into the world, so by one man righteousness was passed upon all the race of that one righteous one. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. There's two heads, if you will, represented in scripture, Adam and Christ. And all in Adam are condemned. All in Christ are justified by his representation. And so that's what this passage is about, what it is to have a righteous representative in the Lord Jesus Christ, as opposed to being under a wicked representative, which can only bring condemnation. Let's read these verses, and then we'll have a word of prayer. Then I'll make some comments. It says in verse 1 of Proverbs 29, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. There's your representation. Those in this righteous one who rules and reigns, picture Christ, what do the people do? They rejoice. He is our rejoicing. But when the wicked beareth rule, if God has not saved sinners through the representation of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that means that wickedness bears rule. People are servants to their flesh, they're servants to the world, they're certain servants to Satan, and there's nothing good that can come from it. How great will be the morning, even though some in this life tend to try to smother or to put away from their thoughts any sense of judgment, yet unless Christ is one's representative, having paid the sin debt, how great will be that morning? The cries that, that come up from the, the pit of hell won't be in remorse or regret, but it'll be in anger against the holy God. Who is he to have saved some by this righteous representative, his son, and the rest condemned? says, Whoso loveth wisdom rejoiceth his father, but he that keepeth company with harlots spendeth his substance. Think again, representation. One that loves wisdom rejoices in the father. Christ is that wisdom. And oh, how he rejoiced his father in coming in the flesh in everything he did, said, and thought. It wasn't just the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law that he obeyed and the rejoicing of his father over his son. But he that keepeth company with harlots, that's speaking of those that are given over to their adultery, that pursue the lusts of the flesh and are not submitted to Christ. There's nothing but spending their substance the days of their life. And in the end, it will be nothing but want. The king, by judgment, established the land. Again, representation. But he that receiveth gifts overthroweth it. One righteous represented by judgment, that word by justice. That's what that word is, establisheth the land. But he that received gifts, bribes, attempts to bring about the rule by taking gifts, receiving gifts, bribery, is in essence overthrowing the land. A man that flattereth his neighbor, spreadeth a net for his feet. In the transgression of an evil man, there is a snare. Again, a representation. There's the evil man. Verse 6, but the righteous doth sing and rejoice. That righteous one 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. Scornful men bring city into a snare, but a wise, but wise men turn away wrath. If a wise man contendeth with a foolish man, whether he rage or laugh, there is no rest. That's the reason there's conflict today, because there's one seated on the throne that is that wise man who's accomplishing his will, but men without the knowledge of Christ are as fools. They're constantly raging against this one that God has set upon his holy throne. Therefore, there is never no rest for those. The bloodthirsty hate the upright, but the just seek his soul. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. So you got two different representations. Those that are fools, that speak foolishly, they utter their mind, out of the heart the mouth speaks, and it's nothing but foolishness before a holy God, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. I think about our Lord Jesus Christ, when men picked and poked at him, and sought to ensnare him, how many times did it say he opened not his mouth? Because he knew that he knew, first of all, those were his. And he knew those also that were reserved for judgment. And what it says, he keepeth it till afterwards. Everything is manifest in its time. Our Lord said, wisdom is justified of her children. They were mocking him, but he said, no, it'll be manifest who are my true children and who aren't. If a ruler hearken to lies, all his servants are wicked. There again is that representative. It's a ruler, and yet hearkens to lies. It's nothing but a liar himself. And so will be all his servants. They take their lead from their representative. Why are we sinners today? Well, it's because we're an Adam. That's why we sin. That's why we lie. That's why the Lord said of the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil who was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. The poor and the deceitful man meet together. The Lord lighteneth both their eyes. The king that faithfully judgeth the poor. Think here of Christ. Who is it that he came to save? The poor. Not materially so, but spiritually so. Blessed are the poor. Why? Because they have in Christ that faithful representative. And it says his throne shall be established forever. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. Pray that you would now, by your spirit, open up our hearts and minds to behold in this portion that we've read, this great truth of representation, that had you so purposed to leave us under our father Adam, as having been our representative there in the garden, we would know nothing but depravity and condemnation. Oh, wonder of wonders that you have established your representative for the salvation of that people that you have chosen out of all of fallen humanity, that he should be that representative unto us, being made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, that he that glorieth will the glory of the Lord. So I pray that as we look at the scripture that Truly our hearts would be drawn to your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that our hearts would be filled with praise for his great work of salvation. And we're mindful to give you all the praise and the glory and honor in his precious name, amen. So when we come back here in verse chapter 29, verse one, we see what man is. You can blame Adam and say, well, it's because of Adam I am what I am. No, it's, it's because of our sin, we are what we are. And if you want a good picture of what it is to be a sinner, here it is in verse one. He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck. And it talks about the reproof. You talk about God and his providence and how he unsettles sinners in their way. They just get building something and the Lord tears it down. And all those providence, that's his rebuke. But even from his word, men read this word and they see what it declares concerning God and his glory. 
and yet left to themselves, their neck is hardened. They would rather give the glory to themselves than give the glory to Christ. They would rather believe that somehow their works mean something, even though the scriptures are clear that God accepts no work from man's hands. The only work he's ever accepted is that of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the more often reproved, left to ourselves, our neck is hard. That, it just manifests what's in this heart. How often have we read these scriptures and it goes contrary to what our thinking is, and so what do we do? We justify ourselves rather than justify God. That's a hardening of the heart. But any that are left in that particular state, unless God by his grace is pleased to do a work in those that he has chosen, we would be like these, suddenly destroyed. And notice, without remedy. That's because the only remedy is in that righteous representative. We're not saved because we're any better than anybody else. We have just as hardened a heart as anybody. We have as, as stiff a neck as anybody. And were it not for the grace of God, we would continue in that dis disobedience that we have inherited from our father Adam. And only destruction would await us. That without remedy. This describes that kind of person, and this would be all of us, but for the grace of God, who thinks little of God, thinks little of his holiness, thinks little of his mercy and grace in the salvation of sinners, and thinks little of the wisdom of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember reading this word over the years, studying it. But it was a pride in that in studying, I thought that I was gaining wisdom and knowledge, even studied in the original languages. And yet the more that I studied, the more I attained unto what I thought was knowledge, the harder my heart was. The blinder, I don't know if you can get blinder, but that blindness was evident until it pleased God to deliver me out of the snatches of my own depravity and unbelief. Otherwise, I would have been at ease without remedy. But this is why we need a righteous representative. Because left to ourselves, none of us would believe. None of us would know God. None of us would see him as he is here in this word. So, verse 2 brings us quickly to that representative. When the righteous are in authority, it speaks here of a nation or a community. When there's one that's in a position of authority who is righteous, the word means just, deals justly without respect of persons on behalf of all those that are under his jurisdiction. I know you can look around, look at certain ones, certain communities, and think, ah, oh, well, finally we've got somebody that's that's going to rule justly. But among men, there's none just. There's none righteous, no, not, no, not one. We might have some semblance of it, but the righteous are in authority. Some people that are have respect to law or to the Constitution, and so they direct the people based on, on principle and, and authority and justice, but that's short-lived. Any earthly rulers, as we've all seen with presidents and other things, it doesn't take long for somebody to come along and turn their head. Every, every president or authority's head is on a swivel. You've seen those little bobble heads, well, you know, thing it over here and it's going this way, hit it over there, it's going that way. That's what man is. But thank God there is that righteous ruler that God himself has established for the salvation and for the righteousness of a people that must answer to God's holiness. See, that's what we're dealing with here. And 
where such a righteous one is in authority. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord said in Psalm 2, I have set my king on my holy hill. And that king rules and reigns where that righteousness of God, satisfactory to God's righteousness, reigns, the people rejoice. How can I rejoice today in the hope of salvation if it weren't for that righteous one that God the Father himself has established, whereby all those under his rule, all those under his authority, all those for whom he is the representative, have one standing before God. There's not going to be levels of holiness in heaven, whereby these here are here by the skin of their teeth, and these over here, well, they've been, like I read one preacher said, that I'm going to be in the back looking over the shoulders of many other greater men that were greater than I, I was. Well, you won't be there then. But that's how people reason. There's only one righteous and one standing before a holy God. Like in a courtroom, it's not the, the defendant that is speaking. It's the attorney. It's the, the advocate on that defendant's behalf that speaks. And either that counselor or that attorney or that advocate has the respect of the, the law and the judge to be heard or the one they represent will have no hope. But notice when the wicked beareth rule people mourn. There's a mourning, there's a groaning that is a result of being under the authority of a wicked representative. That's true in society. If you have a wicked representative and in our particular nation, everything's by representation. <laughs> you ever heard about how certain ones are being treated in other states and you're thinking the Lord is not that way in your state, well just give it some time. It could, like a the province like a wheel. You're up one time here and the next thing you know it's, it's crushing and squashing. That's so that we never put our confidence in men, but everything's by representation. Here it says, when the wicked beareth rule, when God gives sinners over to their own reprobate minds, like it's described there in Romans chapter 1, leaves sinners in that condemned state. And he's just in doing so. He doesn't have to save anybody. But leaves them in that fallen state that they inherited from their father Adam. There is nothing but sorrow. Here it says the people mourn. The word literally means groan. It's like Egypt where Israel under the taskmaster the cries, the groanings went up before the Lord. Anybody that's under any other rule than Christ as their righteousness and as their salvation, there's nothing but oppression and nothing but God's dreadful judgments that await them. The cries of hell, as I said, are not going to be out of remorse, but they're going to be out of anger for the God that justly gave sinners over to their own wishes and desires and lusts, let them run in that path throughout their lives, and in the end, cast them into hell. Is God unrighteous in doing so? Absolutely not. Paul answers that question if you look at it over here in Romans chapter 9, where... And this is the depravity of the heart. Men left to their own devices are as those that are under the rule of a wicked representative. And it's God that determines who it is that he will show mercy to and who it is he'll condemn. But even when he shows mercy, it's in righteousness that he does so. He didn't just look the other way to save his people. Now, it took the Lord Jesus Christ coming in the flesh as a man and working this all out on behalf of this people so that there would be rejoicing on behalf of that people. But all others, there's nothing but oppression and mischief and judgment that awaits. 
just as it says here in Romans 9, verse 13, concerning Jacob and Esau. See, and that's the cry of the day that what they call social justice, everybody ought to get a fair shot, same opportunities and same direction. Well, the Lord has not made this world that way. Here in verse 13, goes all the way back to Jacob and Esau. They were both twins, the same mother, same father. And yet, as it is written, verse 13, when you see as it is written, think this is according to God's decree. He's the one ruling. He's the one determining. Let's not forget, this is his world. He has set the bounds of our habitation so that none can move from here to there but what he ordains it. I have to remind myself of that when I'm thinking, how on earth did I end up in Shreveport, Louisiana? I'm glad to be here because the Lord so purposed. As it is written, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. That's strong language, isn't it? Beware of other versions or translations of scripture that water that down. They'll say, but Esau have I loved less. Someone was showing that to me the other day, and I said, might as well burn that. Because that's not what it said. That's a strong word. And we know it's that way because the very next verse, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Ask yourself, is there unrighteousness with God having divided up this world among those that he chose in Christ from before the foundation of the world and those that he purposed for condemnation. Is there unrighteousness with God? What's the answer of scripture? We don't have to go into a long debate about this and argue. God forbid that any should find fault with God because that finding fault with God is that stubbornness of heart of which it speaks here in Proverbs 29. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. That's his determining. But look down again and uh, go on down to verse 16. So then it is not of him that willeth. There's not any sinner that's going to will himself righteous or into a better state to have some sort of peace of mind and prosperity. No nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. So twice now, it's of God, it's of God. And then the example is given of Pharaoh, for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose, have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee. What kind of power? The power to destroy him. In his day, Egypt was a world empire. He was the wealthiest man on earth. And all of that was at his disposal. And yet he didn't give the glory to God. He had his gods, all those gods of Egypt that God ultimately in the 10 plagues brought down. These were all gods that they worshiped and yet they couldn't stand before God himself. But he did it that I might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. If you're not declaring the righteous holy, just, sovereign name of God. Whenever it comes to speak of him, that's who he is, righteous, holy, and just, doesn't matter how men cavil, then you're only showing just how hardened and depraved your own heart is. But he says in verse 18, therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy. And look at here, whom he will what? He hardeneth. People argue all the time, well, what, what does it take for God to harden a heart? Just leave it to itself. Even as here, he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed in that without running. Who does that describe but one that God has purpose for? Destruction. He brought him in this world just like Pharaoh, raised him up. A lot of these have a certain measure of success in their life, but in the end, sudden destruction. And that without remedy. You realize that being separated from God is forever. There's no remedy. People find fault with God on that. They try to come up with a middle position and say, well, after a while, God will have pity and therefore then he's going to 
He's going to accept you into his kingdom. And so what do they do? They encourage people to keep praying, keep burning candles, keep doing something for these that have gone before. And until God finally gives in, God doesn't give in. That's who he is and his justice and his righteousness. And when the righteous, when he is in authority, the people rejoice. The world finds fault with such a God, but I'll tell you, when he by his spirit teaches you who he is and all of his glory, you rejoice. I don't have an issue with God being sovereign. Why? Because the Lord has, by his grace, taught my heart. And I know what it would be if he had left me to myself. It's all of these attributes that we see here described God in his righteousness, God in his representative, the Lord Jesus Christ, and every attribute of God, that's another thing as we read down through here about this righteous representative, every attribute of God is revealed in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know who God is, look at his son. He is the visible image of the invisible God. And so here it speaks of his authority, it's in Christ, Christ himself said, the father judges no man, but has given all what? Authority, all judgment in the hand of his son. He's that righteous representative. You're not going to undo that. And here again in verse three, how is the wisdom of God manifest? It's in his son. When you talk about a righteous representative, you're talking about one that rules in wisdom and exercises his will in wisdom. And that's who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Verse three, whoso loveth wisdom rejoiceth his father. If it weren't for this righteous representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's none of us that could please God. But I'll tell you, if he is our righteous representative and we do stand in him justified because of his finished work, not only does the father rejoice in him, who is that wisdom, but he rejoices in those that he represents. There's no difference. I think about David again, going and fetching Mephibosheth, who was of the house of Saul and deserved nothing but condemnation. But scriptures say that David went and fetched him in the land of Lobar, that means a, a desert, and brought him and placed him at his table right along with all of the other sons. No difference. That was David's mercy and kindness to Mephibosheth, it says, for Jonathan's sake. And there's no distinction that God makes between this sinner and that sinner for whom Christ is the representative. We all stand in that same obedience of Christ, that same righteousness of Christ, that same death that he died, that God might be just and justified. No difference. And even as the the son rejoices the father and rejoices him. Where is he now? He's seated at the right hand of the father, whereby the father is pleased with his son. And if he's pleased with his son, he's pleased with those that his son represents. But oh, he that keepeth company with hearts spendeth his substance. You can understand that in a physical sense. and You've seen some that, that's just what drives them. They can't stay out of the harlot's bed, They're constantly running and jumping in bed with harlots. And their substance is wasted. But I believe there's here a sense beyond that because all our harlots, that's our nature, to run after other things, run after works, religion, for example, run after the the lusts of this flesh and pursuing what this flesh considers to be good when in reality it's nothing but harlotry. That's why the scriptures use that term harlotry or fornication to describe any that are left to themselves and whose hearts the Lord, the spirit has not drawn to Christ as one head, one husband. This describes what it is to be left to yourself. And in so doing, anything that is done is going to be a waste. There's no work of righteousness that man can pursue in an attempt to please a holy God 
other than the work of righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the end, all of that will be burned up. Any that do not have Christ as their righteousness. Now, verse 4, you could spend an entire message on this here. The king by judgment establishes the land. The king by justice is what that word means. And there again we see a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ that apart from Christ coming and working out the law and it's not only in his letter but in the spirit of law without that there would be no justice but that's the glorious good news the king by judgment establishes the land who's the king that's Christ and how is it that he has established righteousness in the land so that God may be just and justify those that he represents? Well, he did it through his life and his death. If you look at a few scriptures in Isaiah chapter 42 and verses 1 to 4, you'll see how this is put here. This is the father speaking of his son. And he said, Behold my servant whom I behold, my elect in whom my soul delighteth, who is his elect, that's his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He realized Christ is the first elect, and all others elect in him. That's from eternity, I know that, but that's who he calls here, mine elect. He said, I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth, there's that word, judgment, over here in Proverbs 29, the king by judgment establishes the land. Justice, he'll bring forth judgment, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. That's, that was foreordained. That of this people for whom Christ would come, it wouldn't be just the Jewish nation, it would be Jew and Gentile. He shall not cry. In other words, he's not going to go out and campaign. There's people today that talk about their Jesus as if he's running for election. How many people want to accept Jesus? That's the way he's been. He might cry. He's not campaign. He'll not lift up or cause his voice to be heard in the street. Why? Because he didn't come to save everybody. That's why when you read in the New Testament, he passed by many, left them themselves, but then he went to where there were these for whom he was the representative. That's why he crossed an entire sea one time to deliver one demoniac and then got in the boat and went back. So he told his disciples that he must needs go through Samaria. Why? Because there was that Samaritan woman that he was drawn to the well exactly at the time that he would. She was a Gentile. She wasn't a Jew. She was a Samaritan. What they call a half-breed. Back in the day, they, there was some Jewish blood, but... Then they intermingled with the Assyrians, and that's how they became known as the Samaritans. Yet it was for her that he came. Couldn't pass her by. A bruised reed shall he not break, verse 3, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. And here it is again. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Everything he came to do was to satisfy law and justice. That's what that word judgment means. In truth. No part of Christ's work being left undone. That's how righteous a representative he is, so that when God the Father looked upon his work, he was satisfied in his life and in his death. How do we know? He raised him again the third day. He was delivered up for our offenses, those that are his people, and he was raised again for, or that word for means because of. Our justification he is our justification it's not when I see him that I'm justified no Christ said God said when I see the blood I'll pass over. when did he see the blood when Christ died we're just brought to see it given eyes by the Spirit of God but it's all in his work and here is again the third time this word judgment is used that's why again in verse 4 of chapter 20 the king by judgment established the land when this was all said and done, God the Father was satisfied, and he reveals Christ in the heart of that people that Christ represents. They're satisfied. 
Oh, the joy of knowing a satisfied God versus these that run blindly trying to satisfy God. They cannot satisfy, work out a righteousness that he could never accept. But it says he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have what? Set judgment in the earth. Had to be established, had to be earned, had to be worked out. And the isle shall wait for his law, shall wait for the fulfillment of his law, because everything we're reading here in the Old Testament pertains to him, all the way through this book of Proverbs, the very wisdom of God. Any other type of righteousness will not do. That's why the second part of verse 4 is important. He that receiveth gifts overthroweth it. Can you imagine? And that's how some people think. Well, I'll present just like Cain. I'll present this fruit of my hands and perhaps God will accept it. Nope. Can't get blood out of a turnip. It took the blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and that alone satisfied. But there are many that think that somehow they can bribe God and they're thinking, negotiate with God. How many we've heard that have been on their deathbed? If God will just raise me from this deathbed, I'll serve him. And they're attempting to find favor with God by their own negotiating. You can't. That's as much as giving bribes to a ruler to get what you want. That's not how God works. All of the righteousness of God has already been established in this one representative, the Lord Jesus Christ. And apart from him, nothing else will do. I think of verse 5 where it says, A man that flattereth his neighbor spread the net for his feet. Some people think that they're going to influence God by their flattery though their heart is far from it. God will not be flattered. His justice must be answered. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. All right, we're gonna have to leave it there for now. But I pray that Lord give us a view of just how glorious a representative the Lord Jesus Christ is and that righteousness before his father. All right, we'll meet back here in just a few minutes and we'll